اقتربوا بارك الله فيكم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له أشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات الله والسلام عليه أما بعد أخرج الإمام البخاري ومسلم عن أبي هرارة رضي الله عنه أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال قال السليمان لأطوفن الليلة على تسعين امرأة كلهن تأتي بفارس يجاهد في سبيل الله فقال له صاحبه قل إن شاء الله فلم يقل إن شاء الله فطاف عليهن جميعا فلم تحمل منهن إلا امرأة واحدة جاءت بشق رجل ويم الذي نفس محمد بيده صلى الله عليه وسلم لو قال إن شاء الله لجاهدوا في سبيل الله فرسانا أجمعون Last week we did the story or part of the story of the Nabi of Al-Islam Suleiman as well as his father Dawood Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhima and as we promised we were going to complete or do some more of his story because it is an extensive and quite interesting story Last week we dealt with the issue of the hukum, some of the etiquettes of judging in Al-Islam that come to us from the ayat that Allah revealed about Dawood and his son Sulaiman as well as the hadith that we mentioned. Today we come to another very important aspect of the da'wah of Sulaiman and it is connected to what we will call Alu al-Himma Alu al-Himma having high determination, high determination. In the hadith that was collected by Imam Bukhari and Muslim, Abu Hurara, he said that the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sulaiman said, the hadith says that Sulaiman, he said, tonight I'm going to go around and I'm going to have physical relations with 90 women in this one night, in this same night. And after having relationships with each and every one of them, they're all going to produce for me a warrior who's going to make jihad fi sabirillah. Someone who heard Suleiman say that, they told Suleiman, say, insha'Allah, Suleiman. Don't say you're going to do that without saying, insha'Allah. The Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but Suleiman did not say, insha'Allah. So he went around to those 90 women and he had relationships with each and every one of them in that same night. And not a single one of them became pregnant with the exception of one lady from amongst the 90. She became pregnant and she delivered half of a man, meaning a child that was incomplete, a child that came out before its term was finished and it didn't survive and it didn't live. So it was a half of a child who didn't come full term and it came out dead. The Prophet Wasallam swore by Allah and he said, I swear by the one who the soul of Muhammad is in his hand. Allahu tabarak wa ta'ala. If Sulaiman had said, Insha'Allah, then each and every one of those women, they would have delivered a baby and each and every one of them would have been as he wanted a warrior who made jihad fi sabirillah. This hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam gives us another opportunity to discover another aspect of the dawah and the life of this illustrious Nabi, the Nabi from Bani Israel. And I think if my memory serves me correctly, no one mentioned this to me during the class. Last week we mentioned that Sulaiman and Dawood came before Musa. We mentioned that Suleiman and Dawood came before Musa. And if that was said, then that's historically incorrect. Musa came before Suleiman and Dawood. Musa came before Suleiman and Dawood. Ala kullin, from the benefits of this hadith, and there are many, 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 we just want to deal and focus basically with the issue of Alu al Himma, but there are a few we want to mention very quickly before dealing with that point. From the benefits of this hadith, it is a refutation. And it is a clarification, 
and it is an explanation for the Muslim to know and to understand that your life is not based upon wishful thinking. They call it in Arabic, at-tamanni, wishful thinking. The one who sits back and he says, I'm going to start working out, I'm going to start working out, start running, cardiovascular, I'm going to lift weights, but he never goes and he never joins a gym. The person who says, I'm going to start jogging, I'm going to start doing this, I'm going to start doing that, but he never buys any trainers, he never gets up in the morning, he never does anything, he's just wishful thinking. He's overweight. He says, I'm going to stop eating so much, I'm going to stop I'm going to get in, in, get in shape and I'm going to reduce my weight, but he never does anything. He keeps eating a lot. It's wishful thinking, wishful thinking. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going wishful thinking. Our religion is not like that. The delil for this point comes in this hadith, in that Suleiman, he said, I'm going to go and have relationships with these 90 women and he got up and he did it. He got up and he did it. If he sat there and he just said it, I'm going to have these 90 women and he's just wishful thinking, then nothing's going to happen. So those people from the Turuq of Sufiya who build and cultivate their followers, the murid, based upon wishful thinking, this is one of the many proofs that refute that concept. The Muslim has to get up and he has to do something. Allah Ta'ala mentioned in so many ayahs of the Quran, وَمِنْهُمْ أُمِّيُّونَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ الْكِتَابَ إِلَّا أَمَانِيَّ وَإِنْهُمْ إِلَّا يَظُنُّونَ From the Yahud and the Nasara, from them are illiterate people. They don't know about the religion. They don't know anything about the book. All they do is they have wishful thinking and all they do is they guess. Allah Ta'ala mentioned to this Ummah, لَيْسَ بِأَمَانِيِّكُمْ وَلَا أَمَانِي أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ it is not based upon the wishful thinking of you people, nor is it based upon the wishful thinking of Ahlul Kitab. So if a person is a Muslim and he says, I'm going to go to Jannah, our Umm is the best Ummah, our Nabi is the best Nabi, but he doesn't do anything about it. He doesn't pray, she doesn't wear hijab, we don't make Tawbah for the mistakes that we've made and we all made mistakes, then that wishful thinking is not going to benefit anyone Yawm Al-Qiyam. It's based upon your deeds, it's based upon your actions. As Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, فَمَنْ كَانَ يَرُجُّ لِقَاءَ رَبِّهِ فَلْيَعْمَلْ عَمَلٍ صَالِحًا Anyone who expects to meet his Lord, then let him do the righteous deeds. Let him do the righteous deeds. So the man came and said, Ya Rasulullah, tell me something that I can only ask of you, I can't ask it of anyone else. He said, Qul amantu billahi fumastaqim. Say that you believe in Allah, and then after saying it, get up and do the works to prove that you are a believer. That's the first point. Second point, from the benefits of this hadith of Sulaiman sallallahu alayhi is that it goes to show the importance of making al istithna when we say things, saying insha'Allah. And if a person doesn't say insha'Allah about some goal or objective that he wants to do, if he doesn't say insha'Allah, it is possible that you can be prevented from getting that thing that you want because you didn't say insha'Allah. It may not just be an issue, you didn't say insha'Allah, then the thing is just forgotten. You may be punished or you may be prevented from getting the thing that you're trying to do if you don't say insha'Allah. So that's been mentioned in this hadith, also in Surah Al-Kaf, as Allah Azza mentioned in the Quran, وَلَا تُقُولَنَّ لِشَيْءٍ إِنِّي فَاعِلٌ ذَلِكَ غَدًا إِلَّا يَشَاءَ اللَّهِ Don't say, I'm going to do something tomorrow without saying insha'Allah. This is important. So in our aqidah, the people of the past, from the ulama, of the Salaf and the Salafi people in the past, they used to say, I am a mu'min, insha'Allah. You shouldn't be afraid or hesitant to say that you're a believer. If you're not a believer, what are you, kafir? But you have to add on to it that it's stithna. I am a believer, insha'Allah. I'm a believer, insha'Allah. And not to say it may get a person in trouble in terms of being prevented from doing those things that he is trying to do. Another point that's important is that the hadith goes to show that it is permissible for a Nabi or a Rasul to make a sahu, a sahu. Like we make sajda to sahu, when you make a mistake. Prophets and messengers are human beings. And the Prophet said about 
all of the human beings sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam kullu bani adam khattaun wa khayru khattaeen at-tawwabun all of adam's children they make mistakes all of them and the best of them who make mistakes are those who make toba not a single person sitting here is without any blemishes without skeletons in his closet without any mistakes that he or she made in the past or they continue to make today so we have to make toba the same holds true for the prophets and the messengers and that does not take away from their position the mansab the exalted position of being a nabi or a rasul the only one who doesn't make any sahu the only one who doesn't make any khata the only one who doesn't make any mistake is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's our deen al kamal is for Allah a person's name is Kamal, Kamal, which means complete. Her name is Kamila. His name is Kamil, the great scholar from the Tabi'een, by the kunya of Abu Idris al-Khawlani, rahimahullah ta'ala, one of his students. His name was Kamal. Every time we would say his name, we would say, Ya Kamal, wal Kamal Allah. He would call him and say, Hey Kamal. And completeness is only for Allah. Is only for Allah. So the point here is, we as Muslims have to stay balanced. The prophets and the messengers, although they have a high position with Allah Azawajal, nonetheless, they are from Bani Adam. And when they make a sahu, as the prophet did Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he taught us the sajda to sahu. He prayed a salat that was four rakat. He only prayed it two rakat. And then he made the salams. And then they informed him, you made a mistake. And then he taught us about the sajda to sahu. The sajda of making a mistake and it doesn't take away from their position salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi now we come to the issue that we really wanted to deal with ikhwani about this point which is alu al-himma alu al-himma this word alu comes from exalted ali allah is a'la alu al-himma i think this word himma is in swahili language muhim i think himma it may be in urdu i think so you Urdu speaking people heard that word before himma? What does it mean in Urdu? Courage. Alu al himma, it means to have high determination. To have high determination. I want to bring this characteristic and this point to your attention here today. To have high determination. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants all of us to be people who have high determination. And not to be people who are satisfied with mediocrity. Being satisfied with just enough. This hadith goes to prove that. And one of the points that it shows in the hadith is the fact that Sulaiman, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi, he said, I'm going to have these relationships with these women. And each one of them is going to deliver for me a child who's going to make jihad fi sabilillah. So he didn't want to make tawaf on those women and have relationship with them just to have it for shahwa. He had a goal and objective behind it. So the, the Muslim, when he wants to get married, he has a goal and objective behind getting married. Many goals and many objectives. And one of the goals and one of the objectives is to perpetuate this ummah. One of the goals and the objectives is that he feels personally, individually responsible for the future of the ummah. He has children. He has children. He doesn't look at his children and they're just toys and games and he puts his child on the TV and he helps to destroy his own child. He feels a religious and moral obligation to develop his children for the ummah, for the future of Al-Islam. That's how he looks at his child. Not like what we find today. The child is just a toy, so we give him a lot of toys. The child is just something that is no problem, so we don't really pay attention to their issue. Alu al himma, having high determination in everything. And one of the most important things to have high determination in are the children. But not only that, one of us is working and he has a job and he works for someone. He works for someone. And he has to go to work from 9 o'clock in the morning to 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Alu al himma, high determination says, I don't want to work for anyone else. I'm going to do my own business. Not that it's wajib for you to do that, but not being satisfied with having someone as the boss over you. He's a dentist and he works in some, a place where there are other dentists. He has determination that one day I'm going to do my own business. 
That's what Allah wants from us. He's driving a truck. He's not happy with driving a truck, but his goal and his, ob his objective is one day I'm going to have my own fleet of trucks. He's driving a taxi. He says one day I'm going to have my own taxi rank. That's Alu al Himma, the student who's in school. He's not satisfied with getting the middle grade. He's not satisfied with that. He wants to come in the Saf, number one, maybe number two, the least is number three, as opposed to being happy. In America, we call it a C. I don't know, is it a C here? You get an A, B, and then a C. He's not happy with that. He wants an A plus. A minus is not even good for him. Now let us take a look at Khwani as some of the texts from the Quran and the Sunnah concerning this. And they are many. One of the main issues, measurements that we use to determine if a person has high himma or not is jihad. Fi sabinillah. And we're not going to apologize for any aspect of our religion. We want to clarify our religion to the Muslims and to the non-Muslims. But we will not. We will not apologize. You cannot escape from the fact that jihad is from our religion. But it's the correct way of doing it and an incorrect way of doing it. This jihad is the ultimate sacrifice. And it is a distinctive mark between the Muslim man who has high himma and the Muslim man who doesn't have high himma. Allah Azawajal mentioned in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu. مَا لَكُمْ مِذَا قِيلَ لَكُمْ مِنْ فِرُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ ثَاقَلْتُمْ مِنَ الْأَرْضِ أَرَضِيتُمْ بِالْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا مِنَ الْآخِرَةِ فَمَا مَتَاعُ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا فِي الْآخِرَةِ إِلَّا قَلِيلٌ Oh you who believe, what is wrong with you? What is wrong with you when the call is made to go out for jihad fi sabili Allah? You instead cling to the earth. Allah said that the hayat of the dunya is nothing but provisions and compared to the hereafter is just a little bit. The hayat of the dunya, the dunya ikhwani comes from the word danu, which means to be low. The dunya is low, the reality of it is low. It's not the goal and the objective of why Allah has created us to be here. Just to love the dunya and to put your fingernails into the dunya and to hold on to it and to love it like that. That is not the goal and the objective. The goal and the objective is that Allah Azza wants people to rise above in the dunya. Another example of that. Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, لا يستوي القاعدون من المؤمنين غير أولو الدرر والمجاهدين في سبيل الله بأموالهم وأنفسهم فضل الله المجاهدين في سبيل الله بأموالهم وأنفسهم على القاعدين على القاعدين الدرجة وكل وعد الله الحسنى وفضل المجاهدين على القاعدين أجر عظيم. He said in the Quran, they are not equal. They are not equal. Those people who sit down and they don't make jihad and they don't have a legitimate religious reason not to make jihad. He's blind. That's a legitimate reason. He's paralyzed, that's a legitimate reason. He's an old man, that's a legitimate reason. She's a woman, that's a legitimate reason. Allah said those people who sit back and don't participate in jihad, they are not equal to the people who go out and they make jihad with their monies and with their persons. Allah has given those who make jihad a daraja over those who sit behind and both groups, they have husna. Both groups, there's good. They have iman, they have iman. The ayat went on to say, but Allah has raised the mujahideen above them with a great reward. The meaning of that ayat is just simply to tell the believers that they are not equal, those who make jihad and those who don't make jihad. So don't be of the people who sit back on the fence and you don't do anything. You don't get strong. Okay, there's no jihad right here, what we're doing right here. But does that mean that we still have to overeat and we don't work out and we don't get strong? Does it mean that? Even those people who are a little bit older from amongst us. Does that mean you have to be a weakling? If anything ever happened, you can't do anything to defend yourself. You can't do anything because you haven't kicked the ball or you haven't taken more than five steps running for the last 20 years. They're not equal. Just as the people who know are not equal to those people who don't know. Tell them, those who know are not like those who don't know. What's the benefit of that ayah? 
the benefit of the ayat is to say to you, you already know that they're not equal. The ayat is telling us, hey, be of the people who know. And don't allow yourself to be of the people who don't know. Do your best to try to come to know about the deen. Look at what Allah's Prophet told us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, about alu al himma. Too many ayat, too many hadith. And what was collected by Imam al Bukhari a Muslim. The Prophet told us, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam, lo ya'lumu nasu ma fi nida'i wa saf al awwal, thumma lam yajidu illa an yastahimu alayhi, la stahamu alayhi. ولو يعلمون ما في التهجير لاستبقوا إليه ولو يعلمون ما في العتمة والصبح لأتوهما ولو حبوا He said if the people only knew If the people only knew the virtues of giving the adhan and the virtues of praying in the first row If they only knew and the only way to determine who's going to be the mu'adhin and who's going to be in the first word to pray, the only way we can determine that was to draw lots. He said then the people would have insisted on drawing lots if they only knew. They would race to be in the first row, they would race to be the mu'adhin. And then he went on to say in the hadith, if the people only knew the virtues of coming to the masjid early, then they would compete with each other and race to come early. And then he said, if the people only knew the virtues of praying Salat al-Isha in Jama'ah and Salat al-Fajr in the Jama'ah. The people would come to the masjid even if they had to crawl to the masjid if they only knew. This hadith shows us the importance of Alu al himma There's that person in Khwani who comes to the masjid and he's in the first row. And then there's that other person who says, as long as I pray in the masjid, it's okay. If I miss the first rakah, second rakah, third rakah, it's not important. The important thing is to come to the masjid. At least I'm better than the one who didn't come at all. That's true. But that's not alu al himma. That's not alu al himma. This hadith is saying be better than that. Try to be in the first row. The mu'adhin in our masjid right now, Yomul Qiyamah, the mu'adhin will come and his leg will be longer than anyone else. The mu'adhin will come and everything that heard his voice calling to Allah from the rocks and the ants and the birds, everything is going to bear witness. Those little bugs that are in the wall in this masjid that hear his adhan are going to come Yom Al-Qiyamah bearing witness for him. The Prophet said, if you knew the virtues of being the Mu'adhin, you would fight with that man, not physically, but to say, hey, why are you the Mu'adhin? You, you have a pattern on being the Mu'adhin? You go to the masjid and say, I want to be the Mu'adhin too. Why is he the Mu'adhin? Is it because he's Asian, he's Pakistani, he got more than me? And then, but his goal and his objective is to get the rewards. Yom Qiyamah. If you only knew the reward of the Adhan and being in the first row. He said if you only knew the reward of making Salat al-Isha and Salat al-Fajr in the masjid. There are those people who, he said, Alhamdulillah, I pray Fajr in my house, Alhamdulillah. I pray the Shah in my house, Alhamdulillah. But that is mediocrity. That's mediocrity. And I have to make this point. Last week we mentioned when our brother Dawood became sick, he came to the masjid, he was feeling sick and he still came to the masjid and then he became more sicker and he went to the hospital, may Allah ta'ala cure him. We mentioned to the elders and to your other brothers, don't make the religion difficult on yourselves. It was said to me, hey, some brothers understood that you were encouraging the people not to come to the masjid. So now I have to say, that wasn't my point, how can I encourage you not to come to the masjid when praying in the masjid is wajib? How can I encourage you not to come to the masjid when this is a sign of ulu al himma? These hadith that we're mentioning are telling us pray in the masjid for those who have the ability. My kalam was for the one who he had his foot chopped off and he thinks he has to come to the masjid and his foot is oozing blood. No, you don't have to come to the masjid. The one who has high blood pressure in the month of Ramadan and he insists on fasting in the month of Ramadan compounding his problem and ex exasperating his problem. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about the person who travels to, to, to London and he feels he can't shorten his prayer. He feels that he can't stop fasting. He feels that he can't combine his salah. That's who we're talking about. Don't kill yourselves. Allah was ever merciful to you. Take the rukhsa of Al-Islam. As for the sheikh, the sheikh, like some of our shiuch, they pray all of the four prayers at least in the masjid. We have some sheikhs who are like that in this masjid. I am not telling those sheikhs don't come to the masjid or discouraging the people from coming to the masjid. 
what I'm doing is what the Prophet used to do, what our religion said. Our religion says, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Don't make things unnecessarily difficult upon you. I feel I'm about, I have a serious sickness, I may be on the verge of catching a heart attack or a stroke, and it's time for the masjid. Who told you you have to come to the masjid in that condition? Allah doesn't want that ibadah from you. So that's to clarify that point. Now back to the issue of alu al himma. This hadith is one of the many examples of the Prophet Wasallam's authentic sunnah showing us the importance of alu al himma. From them is the statement that the Prophet told us sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam idha sa'altum Allah fas'aluhu al firdaws fa innahu awsat al janna wa a'la al janna wa arsh al rahman fawqahu wa tanfaj minhu anhar al janna he said if you people ask Allah for the jannah if you make dua for jannah then ask Allah to put you into the firdaws because the firdaws is the best part of the Jannah and it is the highest part of the Jannah and the Arsh of Allah is right over that firdaws and from that firdaws the springs of the Jannah they gush forth so a person as the Prophet heard a man say the man was making dua he said oh Allah I ask you to put me on the right side of the Jannah in the white castle and make my house real nice the Prophet told him, you have made it very small. Why you want to be on the right side of the Jannah in the white castle? Why? He said, ask Allah Azza wa for the firdaws. That is the best portion of the Jannah. That's close to where the Prophet is, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his maqam al-mahmood. That's a delil and the proof of alu al himma high determination. Not being satisfied with mediocrity. You go to the school of the Muslims, Ikhwani, the Muslim Islamic schools and we encourage put your children in Islamic school you may feel oh the Islamic school it costs a lot of money the Islamic school is very expensive it's more expensive to send them to the non-Muslim school because in the non-Muslim school they may lose their Islam they may lose their Islamic identity totally they may come home and they may say and do things that you yourself don't even know these things exist so it's the way you look at it. It's expensive and very costly not to send your child to Islamic school. Now when the Islamic school, we have to make jihad and not settle for mediocrity. We have to raise the level of the Islamic school. We have to get teachers who are going to make the sacrifice to take a cut in their pay. These things don't happen by wishful thinking. The Prophet wasallam built an empire, an empire not based upon wishful thinking not based upon just making dua and sitting down he made hijra from mecca to al Medina. first thing he did he occupied himself with building the masjid and the masjid became the markaz or the center from which everything else sprout, sprout out in the community and from there he got an army and so forth and so on educated his community sallallahu alayhi wasallam and people made sacrifices abu bakr Abdurrahman ibn Auf, Abu Talha, those people spend from their money. So we have to make sacrifices, the father and the mother. Yes, it's expensive to send them to the Islamic school. But if you cut out the internet, if you cut out the Sky TV package, the one that costs 80 pounds, we get all of those channels. And you just got a regular TV, for channel 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, that's it. You'll be in a better position to put him in the school but it requires alu al himma it requires high determination whatever it is the prophet as ali radiyallahu anhu said kana idha ishtadda idha ishtadda al hadaq kunna ittaqayna wa ra'i rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fa ma kana ahadun aqrab ila al aduwi minhu he said if the war became shadeed when we were making jihad, if the war became hot and we were really fighting, he said that we, the companions, we used to get behind the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because there was no one from amongst us who was closer to the enemy than him. Alu al Himma. The Messenger of Allah was in the middle of the action. 
He was right there in the middle. He could have easily said, and the companions wouldn't have said anything. They wouldn't have thought anything. He could have easily said, you people go and deal with the situation. But he, sallallahu alayhi wa used to be right in front of the action. And that was the most heated part of the battle, where the Prophet was, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. The companion, Shaddad ibn Hadi, radiallahu anhu, he said that there was a Bedouin. He came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam and he said, I want to believe in you and I want to follow you what I have to do. Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam said, are you sure? The man said, yes. And then the man accepted Islam. He said, now I want to make hijrah. I want to go and make hijrah and live with you in Medina. The Prophet said, okay. And they made hijrah. The man used to fight in the jihad. He said, be lillah. One of the battles, the Muslims won the battle. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent to that man his part of the booty, his portion of the booty. He participated in the jihad. He has the right to receive some of the spoils of war. He sent it with some of his people. The people brought it to him and said, this is from the Messenger of Allah. He said, what is it? He said, this is your portion of that last jihad that we had. He came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. He said, Ya Rasulullah, what is that? He said, it's from your portion. He said, I didn't follow you for this. I didn't become a Muslim for that. I became a Muslim in the hopes that these people will kill me, will strike me right here, and then I'll be put in the Jannah. The Prophet told him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Ala Alaihi Wasallam, in tastuq yastuq Allah. If you're telling the truth, Allah will make it happen. It'll come to pass. They had a jihad. They shot that man in his neck right there. They brought the body to the Prophet with the arrow in his neck. The Prophet said, Is that the man? They say, Yes, that's the man. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Ala Alaihi Wasallam, Sadaq Allah, Fa Sadaqahullah. He told the truth and he has sidq with Allah. His niyyah was real. So Allah Azza rewarded him with what he wanted. That's alu al himma. He didn't want the money, although he could use the money. Although he didn't say the money was haram, but that wasn't his niyyah. That wasn't his goal. That wasn't his objective. The dunya is what, not what he wanted. The Prophet told us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Ala Alaihi Wasallam, Ikhwani, Man kanat al akhira he said whoever the Akhirah was his determination. Akbar Ammihi. The hereafter was the most important determination for him. Whoever was this is his case, then Allah is going to put his contentment and richness in his heart. Whatever he has, he's going to be satisfied with it. And Allah is going to bring his affairs together. And the dunya will come to him despite itself. The dunya is going to come to him despite the dunya. He does what he has to do and he'll find the dunya coming to him. He said, and whoever, the dunya is the most important determination for him. The akbar ham for him, it's the most important is the dunya. He said, then Allah is going to place right between his eyes his poverty. And Allah is going to divide for him his affairs. And nothing's going to come to him from the dunya except that which has been decreed for him. So, ikhwani, this hadith goes to show. As we mentioned before, the ayat of the Quran, it tells us, وَلَا تَنْسَ نَصِيبَكَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا Don't forget your portion of the dunya. If a person is hungry, if a person is naked and he doesn't have good clothes to come out and appear in front of the people, it's going to cause him some stress. If he's bent over due to hunger, he's going to not be productive. If an individual has to come to the people and ask the people for money and for help, He's not going to really taste the sweetness of having a good life. Don't forget your portion of the dunya. But don't let the dunya be the most important thing to you. The dunya is low. The dunya is low. That's why it's called the dunya. The dunya is low. It's nothing but wal <laughs> 
اعجب الكفار نباته ثم تراه مصفرا ثم يكون حطاما ثم يهيج فتراه مصفرا ثم يكون حطاما that's the reality of the dunya ikhwan it's nothing but games playing around it's nothing but mutual accumulation racing with each other how much money do you have what kind of car do you have where do you live it's nothing but racing with the amount of children that you have i have five i have six i have three boys i have two boys he said the example of the dunya is like the example of the rain that comes down it comes down and it mixes with the grass and the people who planted the rain planted the seeds when the plants start to grow green they become impressed and then after that it withers away and it becomes yellow that's how it is it's not going to stay like that all year long after the spring after the summer the winter is going to come it's going to wither away and it's going to become yellow and then it's going to become nothing it's going to become straw that's the nature of the dunya you see it like that it's beautiful but the reality of it is it's not really like that it's going to be a cause of sorrow don't make that the most important goal and the most important objective from what we have khwani from the authentic sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wasallam as we mentioned to you before about the hadith of those two tremendous young companions one's name is muad and the other one's name is muud muad and muud they were the sons abna of afra afra in the battle of badr they came to the prophet sallallahu alayhi they came to abdurrahman ibn auf the muslims are about to meet their counterparts from quraish for the first time ever <coughs> historic incident these people have been fighting us giving us problems now we're about to make jihad and we're about to fight abu jahl and the rest of these imams of kufr and shirk these zalama the two boys came to abdurrahman bin auf and they said oh uncle show us where is abu jahl where is abu jahl they didn't even know who he was because they're from medina where is this man abu jahl that we've been hearing about they said what do you want he said what do you want to do with abu jahl what's your business in abu jahl they said he used to curse the prophet he was the enemy of allah he's one of the rejectors he's an imam of kufr that's what we want with him we're going to deal with him <laughs> abdul rahman ibn auf said i was worried for them so i told him that's abu jahl over there leave abu jahl leave that alone He said before he can grab them before he can stop them the two boys ran off they just ran off into the battle ran off and they set upon Abu Jahl and they dealt with Abu Jahl because Abu Jahl ikhwani he wasn't just a regular man if you look in the audience you may say okay if i have to deal with someone here i'm going to choose this one i choose that one but you look in the audience you say there's some people i won't try them i think i can win but i'm the odds i'm not going to try them but i'm going to try this little guy because he's little over here but abu jahl you see him in the audience no you're not going to try abu jahl because he was strong in his personality he was a leader but they didn't know him and they didn't know the danger they went after him and he said that they set upon abu jahl like two small leopards and they chopped him up chopped him up that's alu al himma that's high determination they were 14 and 15 years old take the 18 year old muslim boy today and say akhi what's on your mind what's on your mind oh i just hope when rooney's foot becomes okay so that he can win the world cup <laughs> that's not alu al himma allah doesn't care about the uk winning the world cup or losing the world cup allah doesn't care about the olympics at all This is not something that's important in the deen in the overall scheme of things what's important is that the people worship allah with tawhid what's important is that the people spend all that money on football and all of that sincerity and commitment and passion that they have for football that that commitment and passion is turned to worshiping allah that's what allah loves The Prophet says sallallahu alaihi wasallam a hadith that shows the importance of alu al himma in Allah yuhibbu muali al umur wa yakrahu safaha Allah loves the high and exalted issues he loves the high and exalted issues and he hates he hates the low things the trivial issues that people 
preoccupy themselves with. Trivial. Pay attention, Ehwani, to the next person after the dars, after this dars. Pay attention to the next person's conversation who comes to you. After the dars, listen to what the person talks to you about. And weigh it in the scales. The very next person who comes to you after the dars, pay attention to what he's going to talk to you about. And then determine, is this alu al himma or not? And yourself, pay attention to what you're going to say to the people. That's how the Salaf used to be. And for that reason, the Prophet وسلم, he used to spend long periods of time not speaking. Not like the Sufis, just don't speak for the sake of not speaking. He didn't speak because when he chose to speak, words of hikmah came out of his mouth. When he chose to speak, he spoke about something that was beneficial, caused you to come closer to the Jannah, to get you further away from the, the fire. Even when he used to joke, even when he was joking, it was a joke at the proper time, at the proper place, and in the proper way. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. So two last points we want to mention, Alu al Himma. And Imam al-Bukhari, and Imam al-Bukhari's book of hadith is the greatest book of hadith. And it is the most authentic book on the face of the earth after the Quran. And one of the reasons why is because he had Alu al Himma. Alu al Himma. Al Imam al Bukhari, all of the authentic hadith are not in Sahih al Bukhari. There are some authentic hadith, many, that are in Abu Dawood, Al Tirmidhi, Al Nasai, Ibn Majah. There are many hadith that they cannot be put inside of Sayyid al-Bukhari, they're authentic. They can't be in Bukhari's book because the condition that Bukhari set for the grade of his hadith was much higher. One of the conditions is that it had to be proven that each narrator in the chain actually met each other. Whereas in the Imam al tirmidhi didn't do that. As long as they were contemporaries and there was a possibility that they met, he put it in there. And it came out to be authentic. Bukhari wasn't like that. Every hadith inside al Bukhari before putting the hadith in there, Al Imam al Bukhari didn't make wudu. Al Imam al Bukhari made a ghusl for each and every hadith. That's Alu al Himma. As a result of that, Alu al Himma, we mention Bukhari every single week we're hearing his name. And a man has been dead for how long? Over a thousand years. Rahimahullah. Alu al Himma pays off. Not for your name to be mentioned necessarily. Not that necessarily, but it's going to pay off. But it requires khwani, commitment, requires dua, it requires the tawfiq of Allah, no doubt about that. It requires us trying to be different from the way we are. Alu wa himma in whatever you want to do. The last thing that we want to mention here tonight is from the alu wa himma is the issue of forgiving one another. Forgiving people who have wronged you and oppressed you. People who you're angry with them because they took advantage of you. People who didn't treat you the way you deserve to be treated and you're angry with them and you're upset with them. From the alu al himma is to let it go. Let it go in the hopes that Allah will let things go that you also did to other people and what you did in your life. That's alu al himma. The one who says, no, no. He did this to me, she did that to me, and you hang on to that anger, and you keep it with you, and you don't forgive people. That's the dunya. That's being low and holding on to the earth. That's not rising above. Allah Ta'ala, as His Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala alihi wa sallam, anyone who has mercy on the people in the earth, the one in the sky, Allah Ar-Rahman, He's going to have mercy upon you. He's going to have mercy upon you. If you gave people in this dunya, you're afu and you forgave them. That's more reward, more reward for you than to get your haq from them yawm al-qiyamah. Because when you get your haq from them yawm al-qiyamah, you just get the haq that they took from you. You got the haq that they took from you. And Allah will replace every haq that was taken away from the people. But when you give people al-afu, afwan, al-afu, when you pardon people in this dunya, the reward is greater. The reward is greater. You can make a tawassul with that. It's a sign of your ihsan that you are muhsin, inshaAllah ta'ala. The point here is, alu al-himma ya ummat al-islam.
So that's what we want to present this week about Sulaiman, Salawatullahi wa sallamu alayhi. There are the benefits from this particular hadith, but our focus and our attention was about the issue of the high determination. As Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned in the Quran, Fasbir kama sabara ulil azmi min al rasul. Be patient the way the five determined prophets were patient. The five de 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 prophets who were determined, they had high determination. Who knows who these five prophets are? The Ulul Azm, who knows? Akhi Ilmi. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ibrahim Musa. Isa and Nuh. So in chronological order, Nuh, he had Alu al Himma. He had a lot of determination to continue to build a boat in front of those people while they laughed at him. And they were saying, you're crazy. You're Majnoon building a boat in the middle of the city. Look how big that boat is. What are you talking about? A flood is coming. You're crazy. But he kept at it. People telling you, you can't do it. You can't do it. What are you doing trying to do your own business? You're crazy. High determination. All right, leave me in my craziness. But inshallah, I'll come and I'll show you with high determination. Ibrahim, Ibrahim, the dawah that he gave in all of those places that he traveled to, being thrown inside of the fire. That is high determination. His dawah, breaking down those idols. And all of the people came and he was a young man who broke our idols. We heard one, his name is Ibrahim, he was talking about him. Ibrahim, we did that to our idols. No, the big one did it. Ask him if he, if he can talk. Going against the culture. Going against the culture. All of our cultures have aspects of it that are oppressive. And it takes a strong person to take a stance against the culture. I'm not doing that khatam. What do you call those things that they make? The bakoras? What do they call? What are those things called? Bakoras? Don't bring us bakoras from the khatam. You have to tell your people we don't want this bakora. If it's from the khatam, the khatam. If they, if they made it before the khatam, and they didn't make the du'a, the yarmi with the bukhura, the bukhura, then okay, bring them, we'll eat them. But the one from the khatam, you have to take a position. Look, I love you, Ummi, I love my father, I love all of you people. I'm not trying to be a troublemaker, I'm not trying to be a knucklehead, but I'm not with this program. The third one, Musa. Ah, oh, Musa going to Fir'aun with a stick, with an asa. He's going to the man with an asa, telling him to believe in Allah. That's high determination, brother. Do you people know who Fir'aun was? The Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that Fir'aun was born a Kafir. Fir'aun was born a Kafir. His adab in the Nar of Jahannam is going to be Shadeed. And Musa went to this man who had no Rahmah and no fear of any human being with a stick. And he said, these people who are your slaves, who your society is on their backs and is built on their backs. They're my people. Let them go. And Allah is telling us, hey, just call your neighbor to Islam. Just call your neighbor. It's no threat. Bring them some food. Give them a book. You don't even have to speak. Bring them some food. Give them a DVD. Bring them some food. Give them a CD. That's it. And we won't even do that. High determination. A Sabrunu Maryam dealing with Bani Israel is a problem. Dealing with Bani Israel is a problem. And then when he comes back, dealing with the Dijjal and other than that. As for the Prophet of Al-Islam, Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala alihi wa sallam, he was a highly determined man. And as a result of that, Allah Azza wa Jal has given him the dunya. It came to him despite the dunya. Salawatullah wa salamuhu alayhi. So may Allah Ta'ala put us on the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah of having high determination, forgiving people, pardoning people, and working hard, inshallah, for those things that we want. So you young brothers who are here, you young brothers, you have to be good students. You have to be good students. We don't want you brothers flipping hamburgers, burgers in McDonald's and KFC. Oh, but it's KFC. It's halal, though. It's a halal now. Can we work there? No, we want you brothers to have better jobs than that. Better futures than that. So that you can spend on your families and yourselves so that you can make hajj and umrah 
so that you can help to pay the bills of the masjid, so that you can help the Muslims who are poor in our countries where we come from, and so forth and so on, so that you people will be in a position to help this ummah to go forward. You fathers, high determination with your children. Stop wasting time with your sons. Just sitting them on the TV. Hey boy, hey boy, what, 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 what's on your mind? What's on your mind? What's the answer for the young kid? What's the answer? SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> the little boy is saying to his sister, say SpongeBob SquarePants fast five times, three times. And then SpongeBob SquarePants. Yeah, that's what our children are occupied with. Oh, they should be occupied with something higher than that. Okay, Akhwani, we're going to stop here. We'll take only two questions if you have any questions. We want to tell you when something is said during the daros that you may feel could be misunderstood, like that issue where they thought I was saying don't come to the masjid, then I hope that one of you, if you hear something like that, you say, hey, you said this, you said that, for clarification purposes. Last night in the daros about the Nar of Jahannam, a brother came to me after the daros and said that I said, all of the prophets died. All of them have died. And if I did say that, I don't know how the whole community, we had over 300 people here last night, how no one would say, hey, hey, that's a mistake. Isa ibn Maryam didn't die yet. Someone else may say, hey, Khidr didn't die, Khidr didn't die. And then we can deal with that. But don't just let it pass by. You have the green light, especially you brothers who are always here, like the Sheikh Suman, like Zakir Sudani, like Abu Umar al-Albani, al-Imam al-Albani, you feel free to make the comment. Okay, Akhwani, any questions? Sheikh Sumal, do you have something? Any questions, Akhwani? Fadl, ya akh. It's not wajib to say insha'Allah, it's better to say insha'Allah because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam many times he said I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and he didn't say insha'Allah Tomorrow I'm going to give the flag to a man who loves Allah and his messenger and Allah and his messenger love that man and the Prophet didn't say insha'Allah, he didn't say insha'Allah but that's the Nabi of Al-Islam, that's the Rasul. His statements are muhaqqaqa, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. But he said it so many times where he didn't say inshallah about things. So it is mustahab to say inshallah for the things that we want to do tomorrow. Anyway. Uh, something about this. All right, let me deal with the people who want to do something related, my man. Because the masjid only has one saf. Inshallah, it's the first saf. It's the first saf. So the hadith and the reward is applicable. The hadith and the reward is applicable. But in saying that, the people who arrived early are not like the people who arrived late. The people who didn't miss any rak'at are not like the people who miss some of the rak'at. So the one who gets to the masjid and he gets the takbiratul ihram, he's not like the one who gets there and the man is reading the surah. When I came into the masjid, there was a brother who was praying while we were praying maghrib. That salat is haram. That salat is haram, haram, haram. And it's not even a salat. If the adhan and the akama goes off the akama, you can't make any salat. Even if that person missed salat al-asr for a legitimate reason, he overslept, something happened and he missed it legitimately, he should come and get in the saf and make asr. The imam does three rakat, he gets up and makes the fourth one on his own. And then after that, go over and he makes salat al-maghrib. So he was praying in the back by himself. He had a sutra, but that salat is haram, haram. So don't make salat, ikhwani, after the iqamah has been established. Ahmed al-Afghani. Uh, 
حمد الافغاني تفضل Yeah, no doubt, Ikhwani, this is the mu'jiza, the fact that Suleiman would have the ability to have relationships with 90 women in one night. Salat al-Isha in this masjid is what time? 10 o'clock. And Salat al-Fajr in this masjid is what time? So we have 10.30, 11 30, 12 30, 1 30, 2 30, 3 30, 5 and a half hours, 90 women. 90 divided by 5 equals how much? 80? 18. That's 18 women every hour for the whole night. And that goes to show Ikhwani that the prophets and the messengers, they have extraordinary strength. It's a mu'jiza. It's a mu'jiza. They have extraordinary strength. Anas ibn Malik said that the Prophet ﷺ was given the strength of 40 men. 40 men. And he had to be strong. When the revelation would come to him, as Allah mentioned, Inna sanulqi alayka kawlin thaqila. We're going to put on you a heavy statement, Ya Muhammad. When the Quran would come, his camel would fall down. Lo anzalna hadha al-Qur'ana ala jabalin naraaytahu khashi'an mutasaddi'an min khashatillah. Had we revealed this Quran on a mountain, the mountain would have fell down. He had his head on our mother Aisha's leg. And the Quran came down. And she felt that her thigh bone was about to snap in half. But she remained strong. High determination. She remained there patient. Because she didn't want to disrupt or interrupt the revelation. If that was one of us. If that was one of us. Not our wives. If that was one of us. We say, hey, get off my leg. Get off my leg. High determination. And this is, the Prophet also had that same strength. He had relationships with 11 women in one night. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That, despite the fact, he didn't have a lot of food. It wasn't like he was eating a lot of food. Months would go by and all he was eating was dates and water. And yet he still was strong. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. Little brother. Uh, because it's a prophet and a messenger, we have to automatically, anytime something comes to our mind, that it could be zina, it could be murder, it could be this, it could be that. Because it's happening with a prophet and a messenger, whether we understand the details or not, we have to say there's some explanation for it. No, it's not zina. It could have been his wives, they were allowed that many wives, it could have been, or it could have been his slave girls, his concubines, it could have been. In the Bible, it says that Suleiman had a lot of concubines. So when they come and they criticize our religion about these issues, that's in their religion as well. That's in their religion as well. The many women of the Nabi of Al Islam, Suleiman. So no, it's not Zina, my brother. Okay, Akhwani, the last question is my brother right here. Tfadl ya Akhi. What'd you say, Sheikh Khali? Yeah, they may say something like that, Allah alam, because it's not, it's not something that's ghayru ma'qul, something that's hard to fathom, because Suleiman asked Allah ta'ala wa habli min ladunka mulkin ma yambaghi li ahadin min ba'di, give me a kingdom, a mulk that no one else has after me. So his kingdom was tremendous. Last question to our brother right here. Yeah, yeah, what's the question? Um, a lot of people turn around and say the Wahhabi and stuff when they give Allah a body, when they give Allah a time and place, when they say Allah is above the arsh. Well, how do you say that or refuse that? Right, the Sufis, they say they are like these Sufis give Allah a body, and the Muslims give Allah a time and place. Right, the deal is on these and the Muslims and the so-called countries as well. What the ulama of al-Islam say is not to say that Allah has a body and not to say that Allah doesn't have a body. You can't say he has a body and you can't say he doesn't have a body like that. If you say he has a body, then you are resembling him to his creation and that's not permissible. And if you say he doesn't have a body, then you're denying and rejecting what's established in the Quran and the Sunnah in terms of what he said. He has hands, he has a foot, he has a shin and so forth and so on. We establish for Allah, we establish for himself. 
We establish form with the Prophet established form, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and that's it. We leave it right there. So when Allah mentioned about himself in the Quran that he has two hands, and the Prophet said that those two hands were right hands, when he said that he comes down and he said that he's over his throne, the companions did not open this door and say, how, why, what? His hand must mean that. What is it? They didn't say that. Why do we have to do it? Why do we have to? Why do we find it difficult just to be satisfied with the religion of those companions? If they ask these questions, okay, ask the questions. If they went after these issues, then okay, no problem. Go after these issues and find out what was the result of their efforts to find out. But if they remain silent, it's wajib for you to remain silent. If they were satisfied with it, it's wajib for you to be satisfied with it. What's wrong with the people today? What's wrong with it? What we have to do is everything but what they did. And this is a delil of Adu al Himma. Allah Ta'ala asks the question Do you people want to replace that which is better with that which is Adna Danu, Dunya, with that which is lower? Bani Israel were leaving from Fir'aun. Musa saved them, be Allah. And they were wandering. They were leaving their slavery and all that killing. They were getting their daughters killed. Their sons were killed, and the daughters for now would leave him for himself and his people. And you couldn't do anything about it. For now, just come and take your wife and your daughter. And you couldn't do anything about it. Musa came and saved them from that. As they were traveling in the desert and the earth, they would say, Hey, Musa, man, we ain't got no food. Can you ask Allah to give us cucumbers and give us onions and give us lentils? We want all of this stuff. Musa said to them, Atastabdiluna levi huwa adna billevi huwa khair. You people have the guidance of Allah, you have the protection of Allah, you have the nur of Allah, you have the messenger of Allah. Do you want to change that by getting lentils and onions and cucumbers? That's what you want. So we say the same thing. Have alu al himma. The way of the companions is divine. Allah chose them divinely. Their way is the blueprint. That's the example. Al awwaluna sabiqun. The first, the uppermost. From the Muhajirina wal Ansar, wal Ladina Tabaruhum bi Ihsan, Radi Allahu Anhum wa Radu An. They're the first, and they didn't mention these issues. Wahhabi this, Wahhabi that, got a body, doesn't have a body. All of that is Dalala, all of that is Bida, all of that is astray. We're gonna stop right here, Khwani, inshallah ta'ala. We'll stop right here. See you brothers on Tuesday. Hada insha'Allah. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina wa ala ali wa ashabi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.